Thank you so much, Natasha, for joining us for the Women AI podcast. Um, we'd like to just start by, if you can introduce yourself and tell us about both of your current roles at Google and UC Berkeley. Sure, yeah. Well, I'm Natasha, and I have a role as a research scientist at Google Brain. Um, and also, I'm spending time at UC Berkeley as a postdoc in Sergey Levin's group. Nice. So I'm interested in finding out more about exactly how you ended up <laughs> in both of those roles. Can you share a bit more about what led you here and um, your background growing up as a kid, your kind of first interactions with computer science, then data science, and then kind of how you ended up doing your PhD at the MIT Media Lab? Yeah, sure. So um, I think even as a kid, I was like very interested in computer programming. So I remember, I think I wrote my first program when I was seven years old. And wow. it was actually a, it was a hand program chat bot. So you could like, it would say, what's your name? And you could put in your name. If you, if you said you were my brother, it would say like, you stink. You know, <laughs> like it was a lot of fun. And then like kept programming, went to school um, in university. I studied CS and psychology actually. Um, and then I did a master's focusing on trying to use machine learning to kind of like answer psychological questions. So like, could you do like machine learning is the next best like statistical tool to like analyze large scale data and answer psychological questions. And so then I went to the media lab with the intent of continuing that direction, still using machine learning to sort of like predict things about people's mental states. But uh, I think I went to my first like NeurIPS conference and just kind of fell in love and decided AI and like deep learning was the coolest thing. And so since then I've been focusing more on like deep learning and deep reinforcement learning. And yeah, that's what I'm doing now. So. Yeah. Wow, there's two kind of two what kind of potentially could seem like opposing fields. It's amazing that you've you managed to bring them together in that research um, when you were at university or college. But during your PhD, we obviously know that you've published a lot of papers and then you can you're continuing to publish papers in deep reinforcement learning and RL in particular as well. Can you describe any of your favorite projects and favorite papers that you've developed and worked on? Sure. So I guess I'm always biased towards the most recent one because I'm like the most excited about it. So I'll talk about um, one of our recent ones was called Paired. And the idea was to use like a multi-agent approach to try to generate a better curriculum of environments to train an RL agent in. And so why should you care about this? Well, basically RL, there's a great joke, which is RL is the only machine learning field where you can train on the test set. Um, because you're training and testing in the same simulated environment usually. So if you're playing like, you know, a game like Go or Dota, you're just in a single environment and you're fitting to that. And so I would argue that RL has this huge problem of overfitting to the training simulator. So how do you go beyond that? Well, if you think about real world problems, you can't really simulate the real world. So maybe the best thing you could do is to automatically try to build a set of simulated environments that you think might cover the real world. And prior approaches do that by just like randomizing parameters of the simulator. But what we do is we actually have a, another RL agent learn to build environments that will challenge the learning agent. And we take actually a special approach. If you just do that naively, the, the agent could design like impossible environments that make it difficult for our main learner agent to learn. And so it's kind of useless. So we actually constrain that adversary that builds the environments using the performance of a second agent. So basically we have two agents play every environment and at least one of them should be able to get a high score. That shows the environment is possible in principle, but um, it should be challenging to the other agent. So um, this is actually like a mini max regret formulation for environment design, if that means anything to you, but I'm excited about it. So. Definitely very, very exciting. <laughs> um, is there any kind of other standout projects that you that kind of was stuck in your mind as well? Yeah, well, there's been a few. So. Um, one of my favorite works was also this uh, work on multi-agent social influence. So we show that if agents have an intrinsic motivation to be able to influence each other, meaning like take an action that causes the other agent to change its intended behavior, or even better, communicate a symbol that as a result, the other agent changes what it was intending to do. So basically be influential on their behavior. We, we show that this can actually act as a mechanism to incentivize cooperation. So agents end up learning to influence each other by communicating valuable information. So basically sharing information that the other agent needs to achieve its reward. Um, and that helps them cooperate better, which we thought was pretty interesting. Very, very interesting. 
so leaping back to that first project as well, I did want to ask you um, a lot more about that. As we said, people I'm sure will have had a chance to um, look at Paired as well. I know I've come across a lot, a lot of articles uh, because it's such a <laughs> research. So it would be great to um, get just some more insight on how you kind of tackled the problems, in including overfitting, how you focused on addressing those and then how what you're going to do in terms of if you plan to further this research as well in the future. Yeah, so we definitely have more plans for it in terms of furthering it. So we, we did do a follow up work on trying to take it into like a more real world context. We were trying to train an agent that could navigate websites by having an adversary construct fake websites that were challenging for it to figure out. Um, so we've already done that. And then the next um, the next direction that I'm really excited about is trying to do um, a combination of this curriculum generation approach with like for language instruction following agents. So basically, um, the agent receives some instruction, maybe it's about how to navigate in like a virtual home like environment it says, you know, go past the couch, look for the painting on your right, go in that door or something like that. So you have the task posed in language, and the agent tries to follow it. So now what if you applied this curriculum generation objective to generating the language instructions. So you try to generate language instructions that are can be understood, but are difficult for the agent to currently understand. Um, and so you continue challenging it to understand more and more interesting language. So that's what I'm thinking about. I think there was another part to this question, which I, I forgot. <laughs> what, was the, what was the other piece of it? <laughs> Oh, that's okay. I, I want to ask you about what you, what you did just mention there. Um, it's obviously in terms of app, the application um, is obviously in the in the media quite a lot. It's discussed upon how we actually go about translating reinforcement learning and deep even deep reinforcement learning um, within potentially industry eventually. I wanted to ask you what how you saw that progressing, for example, with these language models, um, what that would be used for and then what kind of potential you see in the next couple of years and the next five, 10 years, um, and then those kind of obstacles as well in terms of what do we need to overcome, do further research in towards having that kind of real world application? Yeah, well, that, that's a great question. Um, I'm always hesitant to try to predict the future because I think things can be kind of unpredictable, but um, I, you know, I think the the immediate real world consequences of some of this research are pretty obvious. Like, okay, web navigation agents that maybe listen to language instruction. Well, the, Google just cares about that for like Google Assistant. You know, so you say, okay, Google, go book me a flight to Los Angeles. And you have some agent that can understand what you said and go do that web navigation task for you. Sure. But um, I think in terms of like larger scale real world successes of deep RL that I'm excited about, I think it could actually be really useful for uh, climate change and sustainability. So there's um, a potential for RL to be really useful in managing electrical grids to make them more efficient. So it's actually kind of interesting. So um, electrical grids, like as you transition to using more renewable sources like solar and wind, they're variable. So they depend on how much solar, how much sun and wind there actually is that day. Um, and so you kind of have to keep this reserve of maybe carbon intensive controllable power supply in the background. So maybe you still have your gas or coal plant on in case it gets cloudy that day. Um, but the scheduling that effectively, what you want to do is like minimize how much you're running in standby, like how much you're running gas or coal um, while not allowing any brownouts or something. So this is like a complex optimization problem that involves like sequential decision making. So guess what? Maybe RL is appropriate for that. So I, I'm really excited about something like that. Wow. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, did, I didn't realize that um, was a potential application. That's so so interesting in terms of actually applying rl for those listeners who potentially are new to the field how if you could explain a bit about how do you think rl would solve a problem like that for example what the kind of process would be yeah well so rl is basically this really general framework whenever you're trying to make instead of like you know supervised learning you're just making a single decision is this a cat or not let's say but rl you're making a sequence of decisions over time and you're trying to maximize the long-term expected future reward over that whole sequence of decisions rather than just greedily maximizing some quantity at every step. So it's, it's a really general framework for thinking about any type of problem that looks like that. So if you, if you think about, let's say I wanna make like an autonomous household robot, I feel like you're probably gonna need something like RL because you might need to make some decisions that are worse in the short term to get like a longer term payoff. 
right? You have to be able to like walk around some object to be able to get to some distant goal, something like that. Um, so I think it's very general, but I think your question is like, how do I actually get applying stuff like that? I mean, right now the best way is probably still do some sort of like pre-training in a simulation. So if we think of that like RL for grids problem, people are starting to release simulators of electrical grids that you can play with. Um, or there's this like learning to run a power network challenge that has the simulator that you can play with. Um, so I think that's kind of the best place to get started. Yeah, cool. Thank you for sharing that. In, in terms of looping back to the, the obstacles then, in terms of taking um, RL out of the simulated environment and then into the real world, what are the main, mm -hmm. sort, of main sort of problems that you see that um, you'll need to, we'll need to kind of look into further in terms of increasing that um, kind of more widespread adoption? Yeah, that's a great question. So I guess there's kind of two problems. There's like a mismatch between the simulator and the real world. So some of the parameters are specified incorrectly. And then the second problem is you just didn't build something that you have to do in the real world into the simulator. So you didn't anticipate something that could happen. So I think um, obviously my answer to this, I'm going to be biased, is going to look something like paired which is like you try to automatically cover all those cases that you're not anticipating by having an agent learn to find them. Um, but I think to just be a little bit more fair to like what I think is the promise of deep RL in general, one thing that's really cool about deep RL is the ability to do really easy transfer learning. So, you know, you train on a giant image data set and you get this giant pre-trained image recognition network and you can take that to some other problem and just fine tune the last layers or something. And you kind of like transfer that knowledge that you learn on this large data set to the data set of interest. So if I'm trying to do electrical grids, back to this example, because I think it's like easy to understand, I can pre-train a reasonable model in the simulator and maybe the simulator's not perfect, but then when I actually um, transfer to the real world, I only need a, a, like a smaller amount of data to fine tune and, and adapt. So I think that's something that could be interesting. Yeah, for sure. In, in terms of the in terms of the transfer learning um, approach and using that across different um, different examples, there mm -hmm. are there any kind of obstacles or anything that comes to mind in terms of when you prepare that and then have to do kind of an algorithmic audit on that just to make sure um, it's fair and producing accurate results? Do you have any top tips of of how to kind of approach that problem? Yeah, that is um, a great question. I think probably the recent bout of research or like there's actually a long history of doing research in sort of like offline RL or off policy uh, policy evaluation. So basically like, let's say I get some real world data and I have a policy that I train in the simulator. How can I make a guess as to how good it's gonna be on the real world data before I take the possibly dangerous step of deploying it? So I could do some type of like off policy policy evaluation to get some measure of like, we think this would do this well on this real data. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, but now I've kind of picked your brains about everything that you, yeah. have, you have worked on already. What is it that um, you're actually currently up to at the moment, both again in, in both of your roles? Yeah, so basically I'm trying to pursue this research direction around what I'm calling social RL, which I see as having sort of like three main directions. So the first direction is to show that multi-agent training techniques can actually be useful for just improving single RL agent learning and generalization. So that would be something like paired, like we take some inspiration from multi-agent competition or social learning and show that that can be useful for a single agent independently. The second direction is try to actually improve multi-agent coordination or social learning or communication. And the social influence paper would be an example of that. But I think both of those things are sort of in service of the third goal, which is improving human AI interaction. So if you learn about how to communicate or coordinate with another agent in simulation, we hope that that would actually make it easier for you to coordinate with a human. Um, so some of the other work I've been working on is like learning from human interactions. So we have like a, a dialogue agent that's talking to a human and trying to learn if it's having a good conversation by the implicit signals in the human's text. So like the sentiment, or like how long the human bothers to continue talking to this agent, stuff like this, and use that as a signal to actually measure whether you're doing a good job and learn from that yeah interesting and kind of juggling those three parameters that i guess you're working um within how do you prioritize those what i guess what, what i'm asking is what a typical kind of day in your life looks like yeah i mean i guess i'm trying to work on sort of all the things simultaneously and i what i end up prioritizing is like 
what's the most interesting idea? I think that's sort of the dirty secret. It's like, what am I most excited about at the moment? Um, and yeah, I mean, typical day in the life. Um, right now, I guess I've transitioned. It's kind of been a strange transition coming out of the PhD and into like a postdoc or a research scientist position because I'm doing a lot more sort of advising on different projects rather than just like getting to code on my own projects. Um, so I, I'm like spread a spread out a little bit more over many different projects now. So still like adapting to that, I guess I would say. So. Sounds like you're juggling a lot of things. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> very intense but it, those are the kind of projects as well then if you're um supervising um other other projects and it actually further in ai and in general outside reinforcement learning even is there one that kind of stands out to you that you're really excited about and looking forward to hearing how that progression goes um yeah yeah. Okay. So this is not going to be very in a very original take because I think everyone is excited about the recent success of large language models. People are getting very hyped about that. But um, I'm really hyped about the recent efforts to combine large language models with um, large like image learning models. Or uh, as I said, I'm working on doing language and visual conditioned RL. Um, and the reason I think that's interesting is there's like a fun anecdote. So, okay, I believe that language models encode a lot of interesting knowledge about the world and our culture, right? And you can look at all the studies on word embeddings and what they encode to see that, yes, they're learning like meaningful associations between concepts. But it's actually interesting because language is sort of an imperfect lens on the world, right? So the, the anecdote is the phrase black sheep appears much more often in language because it's like an idiom than white sheep. And yet most sheep we think of as being white. So if you just learned on language, you would have this like biased lens to actually that you're trying to understand the world. But if you grounded that to like a understanding of many, many images as well, you might arrive at something that looks more like a reflection of the real world. And then what could you build on top of that? So I think that's what I'm excited about, but we'll see how it goes. Yeah, for sure. Those two intersecting fields, it would be it's fascinating to see how they work both alone, but then also together. And yeah, large language models is what we're hearing a lot about <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. So it's interesting yeah. to, see, to see where they go. But in terms of moving towards um, the topic of kind of diversity and inclusion, so can you tell us a bit more about your experience as a woman, um, both kind of working within the field of AI now um, and also progressing through it and whether you have, again, I guess, any tips for those who are working within kind of the research field um, specifically? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would feel remiss actually to mention like large language models right next to diversity and inclusion without mentioning that of course there are issues with large language models being biased. And we've been, there's been studies on this for quite some time. And you know, the fact that they're trained on like large scale biased internet data and then deployed straight into products is concerning. And I think we should be working on that and it is really important. Um, so I just, I, I have to, mention that I think it's I think it's definitely worth thinking about um yeah and I guess you were asking about sort of my experience as a woman in yeah what is a pretty male dominated field I would say it's been pretty fun most mostly it's been great I really enjoy like my co-workers and going to conferences and stuff um you know sometimes there's a bad apple or two but I think most people are very respectful so it's just it's been good um but then I think you asked like um advice for maybe women entering the field or Yes, yeah. Yeah, I guess I would say a couple of things. So um, one is definitely there's great resources like Wimmel to meet other women in the field and network that way, which I think has been really valuable and it's a great community. Um, and then the other thing I would notice, or like I, I actually am just stealing this. I saw this from a talk that a woman gave and she was saying that for women, it's very important to consider this, this maxim of like, make them tell you no meaning that like don't limit yourself don't be like oh i'm not sure i could get that position i won't bother applying like i probably wouldn't get it like just put yourself out there try to apply for it if you're not qualified then they will tell you make them tell you no like don't limit yourself because uh, yeah uh, yeah i think that's that was some good advice i'm sticking to that <laughs> yeah, sure that's, that's some really good advice and advice that i'm, I'm going to take from you thank you so much going back to what you said what you did say about the language large language models um and the problem with mm -hmm by incorporating or chat, um, not incorporating bias within today's and accounting for that. Just, mm -hmm. it would be great to get your thoughts on 
on that kind of ethical aspect of developing artificial intelligence as well what what kind of work do you think needs to be done still in terms of making sure that algorithms and models that um we prepare and generate and then deploy are um ethical and fair transparent and uh, non-biased do you have any kind of things that or recommendations that people need to keep in mind with that or um, something that you're doing perhaps within your own work as well? Yeah, well, so I'm not an expert on ethical AI, so I don't wanna like talk about someone else's area like incorrectly, um, but I think it is actually very important that we all be thinking about these questions. Um, and, you know, I mean, maybe the answer is that there needs to be some sort of regulation around this. Right. Like maybe companies have a responsibility to show how well their model performs on different demographics. Um, maybe every time you publish a paper, you have to do some kind of audit about that. Um, I don't know. I'm just speculating. I, I can't really say what should be done. I mean, I've done a little bit of work on stuff like this. We were training dialogue models and noticing that they could be um, very biased. And it's it's not a simple question of how to de-bias them, because like you could take your chat bot and you could say, let's just filter out um stop words like it's not allowed to say inappropriate words but that actually doesn't do it so we actually had our chatbot which is trained on reddit data say something like i'm a woman so i don't really understand like and it's just like what <laughs> like what and i mean look this thing is a mishmash of random sentences from the internet so i don't know what the how do i should interpret that but it definitely said that sentence and you can't like there's nothing, there's no one word that would identify that as a grossly inappropriate sentence, but it's super inappropriate. So, so how do you like detect that and filter it? And I, I guess I am concerned that like this kind of thing could be kind of insidious in these models and not easily detectable. So yeah, it's definitely worth thinking about what to do. Okay. So keeping it, keeping it in mind, um, obviously as we move forward, um, yeah, extremely important. So thank you for sharing mm -hmm. your views on that as well. <laughs> last thing in terms of those people who are out there listening to this at the moment and um mm -hmm. have heard about your career progression during this conversation do you have any mm -hmm. kind of tips and advice for those individuals who are perhaps looking to either move toward more towards the field of rl or um deep rl or just in the kind of field of data science and ai in general yeah what would you like to say to them or if you could go back and tell your old self <laughs> one thing as well uh, what would that be yeah i think the thing that helped me the most is just like sometimes things can seem overwhelming like i remember when i first got into machine learning it was in i was actually taking my first class my master's degree and it involved a lot of linear algebra that i hadn't seen since like year two of university and I was like, what? Oh, what is going on? And so I actually just like went back. I did like an extra Coursera course on like linear algebra to refresh that because I was just rusty and it helped a lot. So I think like every time, you know, the material has seemed kind of like overwhelming. I've just been like, OK, well, I got to brush up on this. Like, I'll go read the textbook. Or I remember from my PhD quals, I read the entire Goodfellow deep learning textbook cover to cover. And it just like drastically increased my confidence, I guess, because I was like, well, you know, I've literally read the book on this. I feel like I know what I'm doing. So I think like, yeah, for me, it's been just like kind of growth mindset. Like if at first you don't understand, go read something about it. Um, so that's probably what I would tell myself if I had to go back, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> keep learning, yeah, keep progressing. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Natasha. It's been so interesting to hear more about your background, uh, what you're working on at the moment, and also interesting to hear your advice for those um, both women working in the field and those who are entering the field as well. And just to mm -hmm. kind of wrap up here, if there was anything that you could point our listeners to on the internet to go and check out, uh, whether that be your work or an interesting project, as you have mentioned, where can where can these guys um, find you? Do you use social media? Yes, I do. So I'm on Twitter. Um, so my handle is my first name, last name. And I think you know better than anyone that people have trouble spelling our last name. So yes, I have the it's... same last name. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So it's J A Q U E S for the record. Um, so Natasha Jakes on Twitter. Yeah. Fantastic. So thank you so much again, Natasha. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.